Ford typically has their Ackerman correct. GM many times doesn't. And if you would listen in a, in a, in a garage in the service area, you watch them turn tight on the pavement inside in a Ford garage, you never hear any noise. In a Chevrolet garage, you tend to hear a lot of tire squall. Does it work? Yeah. Does it work as well as it could? Maybe not. But the, uh, the factories often have to make compromises. It's just a reality of putting things where they have to be. So see, the rear steer Camaro actually has it right. And the, the front steer Camaro, as good as, as good as that suspension really is, really has the Ackerman reversed because they can't get it out far enough with a wheel offset. The reality is I can't put the tire rod where I'd like to. It works okay. It makes a car that understeers rather than oversteer. And this is purely opinion. I have no basis in fact for this, but I know that GM knows better because the pickup trucks are always right. GM pickup trucks geometry is on the money, everything about it. But for whatever reason, many times the cars aren't. And I think the deal is that they built one car that oversteered badly, the early Corvairs. And that gets you into legal trouble. We all know about what happened with the Corvair. But if you design a car with understeer, if somebody gets in trouble and they plow straight ahead into the car in front of them because the thing won't turn, then you'll find out that you'll get sued a lot less often because you can always blame that on driver didn't follow too close and not paying attention. I had an 80 Al Camino and there was no such thing as catching that left turn light and speeding up to the left turn light on a divide highway. It just plow right through the intersection. In fact, I lost that car pulling a trailer because of that very thing. So I've experienced these deals. Now what I like about most of your hot rod suspensions, the Mustang II in particular, and there's other uh, versions of them. Sometimes what's described as a CAD designed IFS is basically a loosely designed, loosely disguised Mustang too. But uh, it really has good geometry. It has, uh, excuse me, my uh, laser pointer here, but you've got the, you know, the tie rod is outboard where it should be. And just as I said, if you put this in a 32 or a Model A and switch the tie rods around and swap the spindles, you can do this, but you're going to have Ackerman trouble. That's kind of where we're going. Anything on Ackerman? That's correct. There's nothing inherently wrong with front steer car if the Ackerman's correct. That's exactly right. Um, and again, I have to give you a racing example. Um, there's quite a difference between what they run in NASCAR for short track versus long track. If any of you've done any racing, you'll know some of this. And it has some of, some of the reason they do front steer is to get the engine lower because the tie rod gets in the way. And if you can't get the tie rod low enough, then you get into bump steer trouble. So you get all these other things. And the first time I looked at one of Foyt's Indy cars, I'm looking at the front end because I'm trying to adapt all this knowledge here. And I see they have reverse Ackerman. I'm like, well, what don't, don't I understand about Ackerman? So I'm talking to my buddy Lou, and he says, well, the, here's the deal. They found out with a telemetry at Indianapolis, if you get sideways, you've lost your downforce. If, that's, uh, if that steering wheel's turned more than six degrees, uh, they basically have lost the car. So Ackerman just doesn't matter. So when you go to build a car to run at Talladega, that typically is going to be uh, a car with, uh, where the Ackerman doesn't matter much. They'll get the engine low, it's a long track, they're not using a big turning radius, so Ackerman's not a big issue. You can imagine quite easily that the tighter you turn, the bigger the effect is of the Ackerman being right or wrong. But when you go to Bristol, where you're sawing on it well all night long, that thing better be right. And that's why you'll hear about short track, front track cars. That's one of the reasons, sir. Okay, that certainly does affect bumps here. Uh, your question's a little involved, but it's an excellent one. Let me try and kind of restate it if I can, make sure everybody heard it okay. Uh, when we've got a car, you know, you, you can do an alignment, you can set the camber and the caster, but how do you correct Ackerman? How do you check Ackerman? And what do you do if it's not right? And then how does it affect bump steer? Very, very good questions. And I'm, I'm glad to hear that because it, it tells me that you're, you're following along with the idea very well. Well, this is it, what you do, really. You can, the computers are great. They're just a faster way of doing extraordinary things. You can line up a car with strings. You may have even done it sometime in the past. Take a plumb bob. Find the, you're going to use your draw floor for a great big drawing board. You can do this on a lift, do it on jack stands. Find the center of the rear end, find the lower ball joints, or the, wherever the kingpin runs through, and draw those lines, or stretch a string. A straight line is a straight line, whether you draw it with a CAD system or you pull the string tight. And then see where your tie rod is. If your tie rod is not on that line, fix it. If your steering arm is forged, you can heat it and bend it. Now, you can tell in between a forging and a casting very quickly. A casting will always have a very sharp parting line, a forging will always have about a 3 16 or quarter inch wide parting line where they sheared off the extra metal. It's a way to tell very quickly. If you're not sure, get some help because you don't want to try and bend a cast iron piece. Forging, no problem. <coughs> Use plenty of heat. The key is 
is cool it slow. Bring it up slow to heat, nice bright red, bend it where it needs to be. If it's not on this line, put it on this line. Or in the case of your reversed 44 spindles, maybe all you get is neutral Ackerman. Maybe all you get is straight ahead. Well, that's better than wrong. Get as much as you can. Let it air cool as slow as you can. Uh, the traditional ways were to throw it in a can of kitty litter. If it's on the car, just put some aluminum foil over it. Never quench it. Never blow air on it. Please don't throw water on it. Slow cool, slow heat. And then let it come back, and then you're there. And this does definitely affect bump steer. We'll go right to that next. But uh, in fact, case in point, we do a suspension where we use uh, 94 and later Mustang strut suspension. We put it into those unibody cars like my 64 Falcon and your 68 Mustang. I think it works very well in those cars. But we use the 94 to 04 not only because they're all five lug, and many of the 79, 93 were four lug, but also the 79, 93 car, this is taking you too much trivia, but I've started it. They have neutral Ackerman. Okay, tie rod is straight ahead of the ball joint. It works okay. But they played around with the spindle design. They started putting wider and wider, stickier and stickier tires. Better tires demand better suspension. Because you'll see the effect, just like I did going back to my Falcon. Skinny tire hides it, fat tire shows it. So what they did was they corrected it where the Ackerman is correct on all those. And that fixed the problem, made a far better suspension out of it. So just to finish your answer, this is where we're going on bump steer. Terrific. Uh, before we go on to this, everybody with me? Good shape? Great. Okay, you've got this same drawing. Okay, if you lay out any suspension, and, and again, if you want to check this, you can simply measure from the ground. This is your zero line and measure how far over and how far up, and you can draw it on your computer. You can lay it out on a sheet of plywood with a nail and pull a string. Any way you can, that'll find these points. The, the X dimension, the Y dimension, and you've got to find six points. You've got three inner pivots, you got three outer pivots. Okay? So what you do, this is where this level lower arm comes in. You connect the line from the lower ball joint to the lower pivot, and this goes out in space. Then you take your upper control arm. Wherever that joins it, that is called the instant center. That, in theory, is the point at which all these radius rods are rotating at that point in time in this position. And this is why when people tell you that lowering a car by cutting spring isn't a good thing, that's absolutely true because you start altering all these effects because this affects your roll center. You get the roll center by coming back through that to the center of the tire on this ground, wherever it crosses the center line of the car, that's the roll center. Now you tend to think that a low roll center sounds good, doesn't it? But your center of gravity, how it relates to it is really the issue. If you think about it, your center of gravity is rolling the body out this way. If the roll center is below that, it's going to increase your body roll. That's why lowering a car gives you less body roll because the difference between the roll center and the center of gravity are less. You have less roll couple, it's called, if we want to use an engineering term. I like to avoid engineering terms. But you have less leverage for it to, for it to roll the car. Now, one thing that's good about a McPherson suspension is the center of gravity is actually lower than the roll center. That's one thing I like about McPherson strut suspension is it'll handle better with less roll bar, less anti-roll bar, less sway bar. Therefore, you get better ride quality. Because as you connect the wheels with the heavy-duty sway bars, you're getting closer and closer to an axle. It's less of an independent suspension because what happens on the left now affects the right, and you like to avoid that. That's why we call it independent suspension. So if you're fixing design issues, geometry issues, with sway bars and shocks and stiff springs, you're really working against yourself. It's better to fix the geometry. Okay, so we're going to talk about this bump steer. So we've established this instant center, then we come back through the tie rod. And the inner pivot of the rack, or steering gear, if you're using a relay rod, doesn't matter, has to be right there. And you draw all this line through the center of these pivots here, and we created a cone. Again, the engineering word is it's a trunca truncated, which is a big word for shortened triangle. We're going to get to this in a rear four bar in a minute, if you remember that term. But if that's X marks the spot. If your inner tie rod is there, the thing won't bump steer. Simple as that. Now what happens is, as if you start changing your Ackerman here, if you don't change the ride height, it really is not going to affect this too much. But remember we talked about where you would swap a Chevelle spindle for a Camaro spindle, and the tie rod for the front steer Chevelle is two inches higher than the one for the rear steer Camaro. You can imagine what it does to this. Makes that drawing just go all out the window. And this is another reason why when this upper control arm is going this way, I mean, the instant center is outboard of the car. That's why these cars body roll so bad. I mean, the geometry is just all backwards. 
And GM went back to this poor geometry in those G-body cars, the S10, the 7887 Montes and Malibus. And frankly, that's one of my personal objections to seeing S10 frames put underneath a lot of cars because it's really a lousy front end. They got lousy geometry and lousy brakes. But your mileage may vary. That's just my opinion. I don't like them because of that. There's so many better choices. You see, Yeah, yeah, you're talking about when you get a drag race car, wheels come up, the wheels go negative camber. And thank you for bringing that up. Um, this is a little confusing, going way back to this drawings about upper arm angle. Sometimes you hear this referred to as negative camber gain. Sometimes it's referred to as positive camber gain. Depends on whether you're dealing with sports cars or, or oval track cars. They use the same, different terminology for the exact same thing. Because what's really happening is your inboard wheels going positive camber and your outboard wheels going negative. So it's the same thing from two different viewpoints. But the point of this whole deal, I'm convinced, is the weight transfer. Now, if you were going to make a car turn left all the time and, they, and the rules would let you move that engine two inches to the left, you'd do it in a heartbeat, wouldn't you? See, this is letting your suspension do that for you. And this is the problem when the A-arms are going the wrong way, then it moves the center of gravity outboard to turn. That's never a good thing. Remember the first three-wheeled ATVs that came out, all the people that broke their necks on them? I remember riding one, and the only way to go around a corner fast was to lean outboard. And I just intuitively knew there's something wrong with a vehicle that you got to do that to make it go fast. This is, this is not a good thing. And when they went to the four-wheelers, the problem went away. So you see how these things all come into play. What's really neat about the Mustang, and yeah, I'm a fan of the Mustang. That's why I use it a lot, because everything you can find out about it, I defy anybody to show me anything on a Mustang too that isn't correct geometry-wise. Now, where you get into trouble is, is guys try and put it in the wrong place. Now, your, the track width is about 57 inches hub to hub, which works out nice in a lot of cars. But if you try and put this in something like a 32 or a Model A, first off, we got a problem because the rack's in front and it interferes with the splash apron. Well, we'll just turn the spindles around and use a rear steer rack. Yep, you can, but we already talked about that with the acronym problems. The other problem is because of where the position of the upper arm is, it's going to interfere with your fender. Well, you could bubble the fender, and people do.